Well, first see you, Lord, my Lords, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we've gathered together this afternoon for a, a rather pleasurable occasion, I think, which is the award of the Medal for Military History, which was created by the, uh, with, with the support of the late Duke of Westminster in 1997. So we've now been going some time. And it's been awarded every year since then. Uh, let me say this uh, occasion is entirely on the record. Uh, before I go on to talk about the winning work and its authors, um, I would like to say something about the founder of this medal on a day which is rather special. Um, as people in this room will undoubtedly know, uh, <coughs> the Duke of Westminster died quite recently, <coughs> excuse me, and he will be much missed. Um, the memorial to the life of Major General, General <coughs> Gerald Cavendish Ke Grosvenor Sixth Duke of Westminster is taking place this afternoon in Chester Cathedral. Um, his family know and are content that this award ceremony take place today, and it offers us, I think, the opportunity to pay our tribute to His Grace, who was a past president of Rusi and kept his connections with the Institute. Now, Rusi have posted the Institute's tribute to His Grace on the website, and I'm not going to read that out because you you can uh, read it for yourselves, but suffice it to say that the late Duke, while an assistant chief of the defense staff, worked closely with Rusi on the evolution of reserve forces, uh, a subject which I think was close to his heart and of great importance to Britain's future force structure. And in addition to the Medal for Military History, the late Duke also supported the creation of a fellowship at Rusi to conduct research into military, strategic, operational, tactical issues which has now become the Research Fellowship for Land Warfare. So the legacy that uh, the Duke of Westminster leaves behind in Rusi is a rich one, and I think it's entirely fitting that this library is also dedicated to him. With his demise, we're grateful to Airbus for taking over the sponsorship of the medal, which I trust will now have a long future in being available to be awarded for military history and literature of distinction. Our ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm confident that the late Duke would have been especially interested in and approved of this year's winning book, The, the, the Silent Deep, by Peter Hennessy and James Jinks. I'll say something about the book in a moment. Before I do so, it is worth re recalling briefly what the judging panel looks for. And let me say how grateful I am to other members of the panel uh, in making the award. It goes without saying that it should be good history, and by that I mean well-grounded and supported in fact, which is fairly and responsibly interpreted. We look for an original contribution to knowledge and understanding of the subject being written about, and we value well-written English, a commodity not always on offer. Uh, <clears throat> we often have a hard time selecting the winner and this year was, I have to say, no exception. And all the books on the shortlist are worth reading and would grace any library. The Silent Deep is published by Penguin. It traces the history of the Royal Navy Submarine Service since the Second World War. And I think that's one of the parts of British military capability which is least written about and relatively unknown to the general public. And the reasons, I think, are, are fairly obvious for this, but it certainly has been a lacuna in our knowledge and understanding. And this book, I think, does a great deal to fill that gap. Uh, as well as uh, access to official papers, the account is much enriched and enlivened by access to personal diaries and recollections of members of the service. And uh, they, it always adds something very enjoyable to hear, you know, the voice of somebody who's been involved speaking. And the authors have trodden a line, I think, uh, between um, giving us an authoritative, if incomplete, account of post-war development of the service, and at the same time not revealing those matters which are still relevant to current tactics and capabilities, and which, I have to say sadly, is becoming uh, relevant again in a period of renewed and considerable international tension. Indeed, my impression is we've come some ways, in some ways we've come full circle. You know, with the ending of the Cold War, British submarines found themselves patrolling the world's oceans 
Some of them, I might say, too warm for comfort, as the book brings out. Now we're back in a situation where guarding the North Atlantic has once again become a priority, without, however, I think, being able to relinquish entirely the wider role in places like the Middle East, but against the background of many fewer boats and constrained resources. Mr. Putin has made the case for nuclear deterrence and CASD much more effectively, in my view, than any British political leader could have done. And we will need to follow the logic of this situation more broadly in planning for the future of the Royal Navy. We cannot continue to hand it a mission greater than its capabilities allow. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to refrain from mounting my soapbox on that subject, but I do think it's fair to say that the authors leave the reader with a lot, a lot to ponder, not just about past experience, but also about the future. And this is an important book which policymakers should read. So, on behalf of the judging panel, I'd like to congratulate the two authors, Professor Lord Hennessy and Dr. Jinks, on an excellent, well-timed, I might say, as well as instructive book. And I would now like to present them with the medal after which, ladies and gentlemen, the authors will, take, uh, will speak and take some questions, and we'll finish by two o'clock. Can I now present you with this rather beautiful medal? If I open it, I will just show it to the audience, because it is rather, it is very lovely. Yes. Job <laughs> right, very good. Hot funky. <laughs> Are you going to go first, please? Shall I go first? Do you want to come here? It'll be here. easier. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Pauline, and thank you to the judges. It's a true honour. It's a pleasure to see everybody. First see Lord, ladies and gentlemen. It was, I'll give you a, a little quick outline of the genesis of the book, what kind of book it is and how it happened. Then Jinxie will take you through the serious bit. And then I'll just finish up with a little bit, because it's topical, on the successor, the dreadnought boats that are going to be built now to carry the British nuclear deterrent into the 2050s at least. Because the Prime Minister three years ago, David Cameron, gave us a really quite extraordinary interview about the nuclear responsibilities of the head of government which had not been undertaken to quite that degree by a serving head of government, to put it mildly, before. So that's the order of battle. The, um, the book is not authorised, nor is it official, but it's a cooperative study. And the genesis of it reflected that, because for many years I'd written books on the formation of nuclear weapons policy in Whitehall, when the Cabinet and Cabinet Committee papers came out on the little groups and so on, scientific and technical stuff, too. And the Navy began to send people to the seminars that we had at the National Archives and elsewhere, and that's how I got to know the submarine service. And then in 2007, I was invited up to Faz Lane to go around one of the Vanguard class, HMS Vengeance, by Mark Beverstock, who gave me the stunningly interesting tour. I couldn't absorb it all in the six hours or so I was on board. And as luck would have it, I had already been asked to guest edit the Today programme on Radio 4 between Christmas and the New Year. And so out of that came a feature, which was long by the standards of the Today programme, all of 11 minutes, on the boat that was going to be out on patrol at Christmas time. And this really did absorb the, the listeners' attention. It wasn't a pro or anti-British nuclear weapons state piece at all. It was a description of how you motivate 160 relatively young men to go on 90-day patrols and the magnitude of the task. And it really did arouse imaginations quite widely. And so my producer, Richard Knight, and I were encouraged to do a longer documentary, which we call The Human Button, which also embraced the V-Force days and the policymakers and the decision takers, uh, po politicians, Dennis Healy and so on, uh, about the, the whole business of remaining a nuclear weapon state and also a submarine nation. Again, the sheer magnitude and complexity of all these tasks, all of which have to go right all the time if it's to work. So... I got to know the Navy that way, and the real breakthrough was a, was a result, a perverse result, of my terrible gifts as a navigator, because I was going to Dune Ray with Admiral Simon Lister, and we flew to Inverness and hired a car, and because of my dreadful map reading, I managed to take us through Ullapool, 
And there's only three roads across the north of Scotland, as you will know, and that is the furthest route. It adds 120 miles in three hours. <laughs> But we put it to good use because we sized and scoped the possibility of a cooperative venture of this sort. And we worked it up together. And I knew exactly the man I wanted to be, my co-author, James Jinks, whose PhD I'd supervised on the procurement of Polaris. And we had the right set of admirals in place for Sea Lord, if I can put it tactfully like that. And we still have, with your presence, um, who were very keen on all this and wanted it to work. And the deal was that we'd get maximum cooperation in return for every word being carefully read in case we'd given away the crown jewels inadvertently, because that was not our purpose. And out of it came the book. And we enormously enjoyed the company of the submariners. And we went to sea quite on many occasions with them. And we've got to rather miss the submariners if we're away from them for any length of time. I don't know what that tells you about us, but it's certainly the case. And my wife, of course, who I can never claim that my wife doesn't understand me. She doesn't regard this as research at all. She thought it was one protracted jolly, because <laughs> I'd come back with all these tales, and she, glowing with pleasure, glowing like a PWR with pleasure. <laughs> and uh, she refused to believe it was research. Um, but people always, well, but the, the audience for the book, as it were, I had a sense of, we had a sense of it already, because people are very intrigued if you say you've been on a submarine. They always talk about claustrophobia and so on. And... Uh, you do learn about yourself when you dive. And before I hand over to Jinx here, I'll just tell you the moment I really learned about myself. It was on the Perisher course. It was on the inshore weekend. We were submerged off the Isle of Arran. And teacher in charge of the course said, get up and have your shower early, because at 6.30 we're going to simulate a fire in the galley next to your bunk. And you must be ready to rush out, get, get, get moving very quickly. I was a few minutes adrift, 30 seconds adrift, actually, no more. And I'm sitting on my bunk, putting one yellow sock on. I've got it on already, and another yellow sock, because it's a Sunday, and I wear the papal colours on Sundays, you see. And all hell broke loose. The smoke poured out of the galley. The klaxon sounded, fire, fire. And I looked deep into my soul. And do you know what I said to myself? My God, you're improperly dressed. I had not realised until then just what a deeply conventional English male I am. Well, on that completely irrelevant and absurd note, I'll hand over to Jinxie to do the serious business. What? Hello, um, and can I just say as well, it's a huge honour to receive this, and so thank you to Rusi, um, and thank you to everyone here, uh, or many of the people here who've helped us over the years. So I'm going to talk a bit about the book, and it's really the story of how the submarine service went from this, a subordinate arm of the Royal Navy, on its piratical fringe, as one submariner put it, with a fleet of over 100 submarines at the end of the Second World War. And these were essentially submersibles powered by diesel electric engines, which spent most of their time operating on the surface, only submerging to carry out attacks on surface ships. To this, the modern submarine service that we have today, consisting of a planned seven SSNs, capable of remaining submerged for extended periods, armed with torpedoes and cruise missiles, and of course, the four Vanguard class submarines carrying Trident ballistic missiles. And as Peter mentioned, what this is, is it's really a piece of catch-up history. And our aim was to shed some light into a hidden aspect of the Cold War, a silent war that started immediately after the end of the Second World War, and in some respects is continuing today. So at the end of the Second World War, the submarine service recognised that in a future conflict with the Soviet Union, the submarine would no longer be limited to simply attacking and sinking surface ships. It was going to become an effective means of intercepting and attacking submarines, primarily Soviet submarines, deploying from their northern bases to attack the Allied shipping involved in the resupply of Europe. So in 1948, the submarine service is issued with a new primary operational function, the interception and destruction of enemy submarines in enemy-controlled waters. Now, if these submarines were going to go and fight against the Soviet Navy, then the submarine service need to know what it was going to be up against. And the Navy had also realized that a submarine was ideally saluted, suited to collecting intelligence about the Soviet Navy. And the service first attempted to send a submarine to spy on the Russians in 1953, but the Prime Minister at the time, Winston Churchill, refused to authorise the operation on the grounds that there was little chance of a submarine collecting anything useful without being detected by the Soviets, likely triggering an international incident. And the submarine service, which has always been fiercely independent, refused to accept the Prime Minister's conclusion and ordered this man, John Coote, to take his submarine, HMS Totem, down to Gibraltar to act as an enemy submarine 
and gather as much intelligence as possible on the ships participating in the annual Royal Navy combined fleet exercises, photographing their armament, their antennas, their radars, and using experimental intelligence gathering equipment to hoover up electronic signals. And these are some of the photographs that were taken through Totem's periscope. There's Gibraltar on the left, and that's the carrier HMS Eagle with some aircraft on the right. The Navy was horrified at just how much information Coote was able to obtain, but the operation had the desired effect, and Churchill reversed his opposition and sanctioned intelligence collection operations against the Soviets, details of which remain highly classified, and the files are unlikely to see the light of day anytime soon. Now, conditions on board these submarines were very challenging. Imagine it, over 50 men crammed into an environment that can only be likened to caravanning with much reduced headroom and the complete exclusion of daylight. There was little water. Most crews gave up attempting to stay clean. They would wear the same clothes for weeks on end. And the smell, peculiar to a World War II era submarine, consisting of diesel oil, rubber boots, boiled vegetables, all underlain with something far more sinister, as though there'd been a recent human sacrifice somewhere on board. Now, to undertake these operations, the Navy had modernized much of its wartime submarine fleet, installed, introducing new equipment and new torpedoes. So this is the same submarine. This is HMS Alliance in her wartime configuration and then in a post-war configuration with a streamlined hull, the addition of a sonar dome on the front. But by the mid-1950s, it was increasingly apparent that these submarines were reaching the end of their operational lives. With the increased emphasis on surveillance, intelligence gathering, and hunting Soviet submarines, the Navy now wanted true submarines, free from the need to surface frequently to replenish air that could stay submerged for weeks, even months on end. And the answer was nuclear power. And to save both time and money, the first sea lord at the time, Lord Louis Mountbatten, built a close relationship with the so-called father of the US nuclear Navy, Admiral Hyman G. Rickover, which resulted in the purchase of a complete US-made nuclear reactor, which was used to power the Royal Navy's first nuclear-powered submarine, HMS Dreadnought and the first all-British nuclear-powered hunter-killers followed in the mid to late 1960s. Now, the 1960s also saw the submarine service take over responsibility for operating the United Kingdom's independent nuclear deterrent, building four resolution-class nuclear-powered submarines, each carrying 16 Polaris ballistic missiles armed with nuclear warheads. And once the Polaris fleet started putting to sea from 68 onwards, the submarine service became responsible for protecting it from Soviet submarines. Now, while these new submarines were being built, the Cold War at sea was really starting to heat up, and submarines were involved in a variety of different operations, conducting surveillance and collecting intelligence gathering operations against the Soviets. And while these were largely successful, because the key was always to remain passive, there were incidents. For example, in 1965, HMS Opportune was hunted for over 30 hours and eventually forced to the surface by Soviet destroyers after attempting to spy on a Soviet fleet exercise. Fortunately, the Russians were in a good mood and they merely thanked Opportune for working with them and escorted the submarine out of the area. And by the end of the 1960s, the service was starting to use its new nuclear-powered submarines with their increased underwater endurance to track and trail Soviet submarines during these surveillance and intelligence gathering operations. And this is not easy. And one of the things we really wanted to get across in the book was that establishing a target's course, speed, and range, and remaining in contact with it all while underwater, while re um, relying primarily on sound, was nowhere near as simple as is often portrayed in Cold War fiction or Hollywood films. And there was always the danger of collisions, as Commander John Harvey discovered in the late 1960s while in command of HMS Warspite. Now, Warspite was trailing a Soviet Echo 2 class cruise missile carrying submarine when the Russians suddenly shut down one of its two propeller shafts and started to turn. Warspite detected none of this and collided with the Soviet submarine. The first impact caused Warspite to violently heel to starboard. She then swung back, passed under, and struck the Echo 2 again, causing Warspite to roll to starboard for a second time, this time between 65 and 70 degrees. Warspite escaped to, a, to Scotland and surfaced in a Scottish lock, and the damage was covered in a black tarpaulin while the press was told that the submarine had merely hit an iceberg. Uh, but this didn't convince everybody, especially the shipyard workers who carried out the repairs at Baron Furness, one of which was overheard saying, that's the first iceberg I've heard of with anti-fouling. But the collision didn't deter the Navy, and Warspite, this time under the command of Commander Sandy Woodward, later conducted two additional operations against the Soviets. The first, 
involved carrying out what's known as an underwater look on a new Soviet helicopter carrier to photograph the bottom of its hull. And this is an example of just how close submarines get when they're sitting underneath surface ships. And the second operation saw Warspite go up against a new Soviet Yankee-class ballistic missile-carrying submarine and attempt to measure the height of its missile tubes in order to determine the height of the nuclear missiles it was carrying and thus their range. Now, during this whole period, submariners start to calculate victory and defeat in a different way to past undersea conflicts in terms of surveillance, detection, and monitoring. If you could find the enemy, determine his location, his capabilities, and follow him, you were victorious by Cold War standards. And by demonstrating that the Royal Navy, alongside the US Navy, was in control over what was happening at sea, Royal Navy submariners hoped that their actions would deter the Russians. And so from the 1970s onwards, Royal Navy submarines put to sea with the aim of developing in the Russians an inferiority complex. The thought, were that then, the thought that whenever they went to sea, they would know that there was going to be a Royal Navy or a US Navy submarine around that could probably hear what they were doing and thus attack at any moment. So every submarine operation had to contain, as one submariner from the time put it, an underlying element of threat such as to make the use of force an unattractive option. And the service started to demonstrate that it could do this anywhere in the world. So in early 1971, HMS Dreadnought became the first British nuclear-powered submarine to go underneath the Arctic ice cap and punch through at the North Pole. Now, by the late 1970s, the introduction of new technology and equipment, as well as the development of new techniques and tactics, had allowed the Royal Navy submariners to conduct increasingly effective trails of Soviet submarines. So to give you one example, in 1978, HMS Sovereign was able to follow a Soviet ballistic missile carrying submarine as it zigzagged across the Atlantic for a total of 49 days, gathering vast quantities of intelligence. But the Soviet Union was not the only threat in the 1970s. In 1977, HMS Dreadnought was sent to the South Atlantic to deter possible Argentinian action against the Falkland Islands. And following the invasion of the islands in 1982, a number of Royal Navy submarines deployed to the South Atlantic and they had numerous opportunities to sink significant numbers of Argentinian warships, but they were prevented from doing so by the War Cabinet back in London, which was worried about the repercussions of any attack on international opinion. On 29th of April, for example, Roger Lane Knott, the commanding officer of HMS Splendid, found himself looking at five Argentinian frigates through Splendid's periscope, but he was unable to attack due to restrictive rules of engagement. Now, one of the most significant events of the Falklands conflict, and indeed the history of the modern submarine service, was the attack on the Argentinian cruiser General Belgrano by HMS Conqueror on the 2nd of May, 1982. An awful lot has been written about this particular event, but for those who are unfamiliar with what happened, the commander of the task force sent to liberate the Falklands, Admiral Sandy Woodward, a submariner of course, believed that his aircraft carriers were about to come under attack on two fronts, the victim of a classic pincer movement. His problem was that to the north, the two submarines and aircrafts he had sent to look for the Argentinian aircraft carrier couldn't find it. To the south, HMS Conqueror was already in contact with the Belgrano, but it, but it did not have the necessary approval from London to carry out an attack. Deeply worried, Woodward, who didn't have control over the submarines, um, exceeded his authority and sing signalled Conqueror to sink the Belgrano. And he did this because he, his explanation was that he knew that his new superiors back in Northwood would see the order and immediately take it off the satellite before Conqueror could download it. He also knew that they would think one of two things. Either Woodward had gone mad or he was deadly serious and required an urgent decision. So a meeting of the War Cabinet was quickly convened at Chequers where ministers were briefed and they agreed to alter the rules of engagement to allow the attack. So at 6.57, after achieving a good fire control solution on the Belgrano, Conqueror fired three torpedoes. Two hit and killed more than 200 of the Belgrano's crew, while the third apparently hit one of the escorting destroyers. And after the sinking, the Argentinian Navy didn't venture out into the open sea again. If it had, it probably would have suffered significant losses. And this was a truly powerful demonstration of the deterrent effect of the nuclear submarine. But it was also a distraction from the Cold War, which was really starting to heat up in the 1980s. The 1981 Defence Review had already sought to drastically reshape the Royal Navy by reducing the size of the surface fleet, but at the same time increasing the size of the submarine fleet to 17 nuclear attack submarines. New Trafalgar-class submarines commissioned into the Navy, and a number of Nimrod maritime patrol aircraft used to hunt Soviet submarines was also increased, 
A new class of conventional submarine, the Upholder class, was also ordered to carry out a number of tasks ordinarily assigned to the nuclear submarines to free them up. And the 1980s saw that vast program to replace Polaris with a far more powerful Trident and a new class of submarine, the Vanguard class. Operations against the Soviets continued, and as well as tracking and trailing Soviet submarines, submariners now started to close in on those submarines, acquiring fire control solutions and conducting simulated firings. Now, one of the reasons the Royal Navy and indeed the US Navy was so successful at tracking and trailing Soviet submarines was that for much of the Cold War, the US and the UK placed enormous emphasis on quality from the 1960s onwards, producing relatively few classes of highly capable, quiet submarines and manning them with highly trained and professional crews. On the other side, the Soviets tended to focus on quantity, quantity over quality, producing large numbers of submarines of various classes that were, for the most part, noisy and easy to detect. But this changed in the 1980s, after the Soviets realized that they weren't as good as they thought they were, thanks to intelligence provided by a spy ring operating in the United States, the Walker Whitworth spy ring. And the Soviets started building highly capable submarines, such as the Akula, or as it was known in the US Navy, the Walker class, and they retrofitted their older submarines with noise quietening technology and developed tactics designed to complicate US Navy and Royal Navy trailing efforts. They also eventually retreated further north to the waters beneath the Arctic ice cap, where detection was far more difficult. And Royal Navy submariners, alongside US Navy submariners, were now forced to perfect an entirely new art, under ice warfare, which required new tactics, new equipment, and new torpedoes. And the most prized targets were the Soviet ballistic missile submarines, such as the Typhoon, which was built with one purpose in mind, to hide under the Arctic ice and use its vast size to punch through and fire off its missiles in the event of war. But then the Soviet system collapsed, the Berlin Wall came down, and the Cold War ended. Or did it? Well, when the Russians could get one of their submarines to sea, they would. But as the country descended into financial collapse throughout the 1990s, large parts of the once mighty Soviet Navy was reduced to rusting hulks, barely able to deploy. And with the disappearance of the threat, there are inevitably significant reductions in the size of the Royal Navy's submarine fleet, from about 17 SSNs to just the Plan 7 today, alongside the four vanguards. And to stay relevant, the submarine service was forced to shift away from its Cold War operations. So in the late 1990s, the service is equipped with a Tomahawk land attack missile, and it developed new means of deploying and extracting special forces. And these new capabilities have seen submarines involved in almost every conflict involving British forces since the end of the Cold War. So today, well, a new fleet of astute class attack submarines to replace the Cold War era Trafalgar class already entering service, and on current plans, four Dreadnought class SSBNs carrying Trident missiles will enter service at some point in the early 2030s. And one of the biggest questions facing the Royal Navy today is whether its submarine fleet is too small to meet the many commitments that are asked of it because those commitments are increasing as a resurgent Russia is once again put into sea. Vladimir Putin is pouring billions into constructing new submarines, such as the new Yasin class and the new Bori class, strategic missile carrying submarines. And what's really significant about these new Russian boats is that they've continued to place enormous emphasis on quality as opposed to quantity. So any future underwater confrontation will, unlike most of the Cold War, truly be one of quality versus quality, which is why, People are so important. A student dreadnought will mean nothing unless they are properly manned with experienced and motivated people. Because in the future, the Royal Navy is still going to require small numbers of men and now women to go silently into the deep to conduct those complex, demanding and highly secret operations for Her Majesty. As in the Cold War, the public is going to hear very little about their exploits. Despite the revelations in our book, the submarine service remains true to its traditions, a silent service. And what, what, what Rudyard Kipling wrote in his 1918 poem about the service, or the trade, as he called it, remains very true today. Their feats, their fortunes, and their fames are hidden from their nearest kin. No eager public backs or blames, no journal prints the yarn they spin. The censor would not let it in. When they return from run or raid, unheard they work, unseen they win. That is the custom of the trade. Thank you very much. James mentioned the yeah. notion of catch-up history. I've always thought that those who do good and difficult and dangerous things for the Queen 
out of the gaze of the public, and indeed Parliament very often should have their place in the historical sun when it's safe to do so, and this is a classic example of that. But there's a craving that we historians have which go with that. Wouldn't it be wonderful if somehow we could interview Mr Attlee shortly after his Cabinet Committee took the decision to get Britain into the business of becoming a nuclear weapon state in the first place, January 47? It would, of course, have been a deeply unsatisfactory interview because Mr Attlee was the tersest person who was ever going to have occupied number 10, and as Douglas Jay once said to me, would never use one syllable where none would do. But one would like to have had a crack at Mr Attlee on the reasons for this, even though we know what they are pretty well. And also Winston Churchill and the move from fission to fusion, atomic bombs to hydrogen bombs, and the fifth, took it to full cabinet three times in 1954. But we did have what I regarded as a considerable breakthrough, actually, in preparing the book, when the Prime Minister, David Cameron, agreed to talk to us about what it felt like having the very special nuclear responsibilities that fall to a Prime Minister, framing the so-called last resort letters, the Prime Minister's wishes from beyond the grave inside the inner safe of each of the four Trident Vanguard submarines. And we sat in the, his Prime Minister's office where he'd actually taken the decision, what he wanted to put in those letters. And this is what he said. I asked John Major in and asked for his advice, and I talked to him about it. I also talked to the Chief of the Defence Staff. But then in the end, it's you in the office on your own. I sat at that chair, and there was a great big shredder that was placed right here, and you write, and then you seal it up. Hopefully nobody will ever see these letters. Each of them goes into the safe of the Trident submarine. And, as usual, I've managed to get the wrong bit of paper. It will emerge has emerged. <clears throat> and hopefully when you stop being Prime Minister, they take it out and burn it, and no one will ever have opened it. It's a very big moment, said the Prime Minister. It's the oddest in a way. You've seen Prime Ministers drive up to Buckingham Palace. You've seen them walking through the door of Number 10. You can't really believe you're doing it yourself, but that bit in your office, writing out the letters with the shredder, it's such an extraordinary thing to have to do. You can't really imagine it until you do it. And indeed, he confirmed what I've always thought. That's the moment people realise what being Prime Minister is all about, the things that only you can do, a magnitude that's almost beyond the imagination. And I would imagine Mrs May's done the drill already, so all that's in place. I certainly hope so. Uh, who said that, Alan? <laughs> and Lord West says he hopes so. I'm sure he's, he's right. It's all taken care of. And now we know there's going to be, as Ernest Bevin would have put it, or put it originally, a bloody Union Jack on top of it, into the 2050s. So continuous at sea deterrence began on the 14th of June 1969 and will go right through to the 2050s. The 14th of June 1969 is deeply imprinted in my memory because it also happens to be the day I got married. <laughs> and you will be pleased to hear, ladies and gentlemen, that Mrs. Hennessy and I have sustained the marital equivalent of continuous at sea deterrence ever <laughs> since. Whatever that might mean. <laughs> Let's have some questions. <laughs> Now's your opportunity to, to uh, add any comments, quizzes. Sir, over there. Uh, could you just say who you are? And perhaps stand up. I think it would make it easier for everyone. Uh, I think there's a microphone on its way. Oh, we, oh, sure. yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, the, the name's Ewan Grant. I'm the former Customs and Excise Intelligence Analyst covering the ex-Soviet Union, I did manage quite seriously to get Captain Ramius in a report I did in the late 90s on cigarette smuggling from Lithuania um, and indeed from across the border in Kaliningrad. My question is, um, the book rightly um, stresses the very close cooperation with the United States. Um, where do we stand now in relations with the European submarine building and indeed submarine operating countries, particularly in, li in the light of developments of AIP and so on and their possible utilisation in out of European areas like the South China Sea and so on? Thank you. Well, we do a little bit on the collaboration with the French in... Um Tutatis and all that. But we're not expert on that. This room is full of experts on that, who I'm sure 
would like to tell you but probably can't. One of the interesting things in terms of the Anglo-American relationship is that when Rickover allowed the sale of that S5W reactor, which went into Dreadnought back in the late 50s, that was done on the condition that it was a one-off purchase, the British would own it, and then they would stand on their own two feet afterwards. And we did have to go back a few times when there were problems occasionally. Um, but that really stayed the same right the way through the Cold War. But now, with PWR3, we are back with the Americans working together on PWR3. So it's quite interesting there how the relationship now on the strategic weapons side, but also on the um, on the on the back end, uh, that 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 is now as close as it's probably ever been back back to that relationship in the 60s. And it, it all comes back to um, it's Admiral William Crow, who was Bill Clinton's ambassador, uh, when he used to be asked about the special relationship. Um, he would always say, I always describe it like an iceberg, in that there's a small little tip of it sticking out above the water, but beneath the waves, there's a huge amount of activity that goes on between our two countries that is absolutely unprecedented in the world. I didn't really understand what he was talking about when I first read that a couple of years ago, but now, having researched in this book, it's pretty clear that he was hinting at what goes on beneath the waves between the US and the UK. I hope the new president is briefed soon and carefully on the Polaris sales agreement of 1963. Because <laughs> I've never been a member of CND, but if I was, I'd work on the American president. Because if he pulls the plug on that, we're out of the business in about 18 months, aren't we? Yeah. Not that I want to give anybody any ideas. <laughs> no, I think, Do you want to come in? Um, yes. Beatrice Hughes at University of Reading. Thank you very much for this absolutely excellent presentation and for the marvellous book that we greatly uh, appreciate it. Um, you talked about um, whether you've given away the, the family silver. Um, when you started, uh, Peter, when you first started writing about this, it was a bit in a period of greater detente than we are in now. Mm. And you were talking about the letters of last resort. Do you feel that you have given away some of the family silver there? I've always thought it was part of the spectrum of deterrence, really, and indeed talked to some people about that before I published that a few years ago. And if I remember, I've never been able to verify this. Somebody in this room might want a quiet word with us afterwards. That when the last resort system was created in the early 70s, in Ted Heath's premiership, the cabinet secretary of the day, Burke Trend, who was a remarkable man who I knew, but of course never talked to about anything like this, said that if the United States, in a crisis was not taking our wishes, our needs seriously as a UK, he would personally call in the Russian ambassador and say, don't even think about making an example of the UK, because you've never, fought, you've never found any of our Polaris boats, and the Prime Minister's wishes from on the grave are already in there, and you're never going to find them, so don't even think about it. I will personally bring him into this office and brief him, is what Burke Trend allegedly said. So I've always regarded it as part of the spectrum of deterrence. But I did think about it, Beatrice. Before I wrote, to be released to here. <laughs> Axel and Independent, I'd say. Je Aaron West. Uh, yes. uh, Lord West. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of family silver, certainly 20 years ago, if we'd said some of the things in your book, we'd have been banged up, <laughs> without a doubt. So there yes. were some very interesting things for the first time written down there, I think. Um, my question really is, is aimed at you, Peter, and with your deep knowledge of, uh, uh, of Whitehall. Do you think ever again we could do something like um, have a Chevaline program, the number of us were discussing this earlier, completely hidden from everybody. Uh, let's face it, even the bulk of the Labour Party, luckily. Um, uh, it's only a couple on the front bench knew, um, and certainly no one, no one else knew. Do you think we could ever achieve that again in the environment we're in now? I'd be very interested to know. I don't think we could. There was a whisper of it. It was called the Polaris Improvement Program. It used to appear in the white papers, which we all read avidly. And indeed, I wrote, wrote the, quite a bit on Chevalier in the Times in the early 80s because it was the, Malcolm will remember the dates better than me, I think it was the 1918, 1980 Defence White Paper said its application, this is after Francis Pimmer, Francis Pimmer avowed it in the Commons, that its application was imminent. And then the 1981 Defence White Paper said as soon as possible. So I realised something had gone wrong and began to inquire. But it was very difficult to do it in those days. And some of my journalistic colleagues here might think this was wrong for me to have done this. But before I wrote all that stuff up, it was a feature, it was a column, and it was a leader which I'd written in the front page news story. I um, showed the text to MOD and said, if there's anything in here that tells the Russians, it's back to your question, Beatrice, things that they don't know and shouldn't know, just tell me. And the word came back, it's very embarrassing, we'd rather you didn't publish it, but the Russians won't learn anything from this. So 
it wasn't denotice quite, Alan. It was, uh, it was in the spirit of denotice, which I was happy enough to do, and indeed the Times was, although some of my more energetic journalistic colleagues might have thought that might have made me a, a bit of an Uncle Tom when it came to nuclear matters. But it was a serious business, the Cold War. It is a serious business now. It has never ceased to be a serious business. So, well, that's a terrible phrase. It's like postmodernism. I think it's bollocks on stilts, but we're lumbered with it, aren't we? <laughs> Anybody on this side? Sir, the back. Uh, Josh Arnold Forster. I used to work for John Reed and a member of the Institute. Um, and firstly, thank you very much for your talk. I'm deeply looking forward to reading your book. Um, second, um, one of the things I'm very interested in is uh, the recruitment and retention of chief petty officers for the submarine service, especially in, in the engineering uh, uh, area. What were, what were the sort of problems and then how did they solve those problems for recruitment and especially retention of that class of submarines? Well, there are people here again who are right up to speed on all this, but it's been one of the... Um, Looking at submarine Britain in the round, which is what we've done, it's one of the areas, there are certain areas of that you sense of fragility and precariousness and suitably qualified people of all kinds is that. And above all engineering, and I think quite a bit of it's got into the public domain, isn't it, through the select committee and the newspapers. But I don't, the first sea lord, I, don't, I can't really invite him to answer questions that have been addressed <laughs> to me. But I'm sure it's one of, sure it's one of your big worries. Uh, oh, the well, history of well, it, yes. Manpower has always been a problem. So even at the end of the Second World War, they were paying off submarines um, because a, a lot of the people serving in the submarine service during the Second World War, War were hostilities only, people who had essentially been drafted in. And drafting continued where you were volunteered for submarine service uh, for a, a significant period of the, of the early Cold War. Um, so manpower has always been a problem, but of, I think today it's it's different with um, just the my generation, I guess. So, um, we like to be connected constantly. But my understanding is that a lot of the work that's been done on identifying people who would potentially thrive in that environment, um, they know how to identify them. But it's just a question of a getting them and then keep keeping hold of them afterwards. Um, but. It, it has always been a problem, and it is one of the themes in the book um, that manpower is a problem. It's a national theme, isn't it? Mm. Who else would like to, sir? Thanks, Peter Roberts uh, from the Institute. Um, uh, again, uh, going through the book, I, I think it's brilliant in the way that it, it does the technology and the equipment. You know, the traditional way the Navy likes to relate to things, and the people side, which I think you know, the stories that you hear and you relate come out. Brilliantly. Uh, but I wonder if during your research there was a particular area that you thought, ah, I wish I could have gone a bit further down there. <laughs> if there was one of those themes where you thought, you know, there's, a, there's an area that I really wanted to push a button. But, and for whatever reason, whether it's classification or access or time, that you weren't allowed to, you know, fully exploit. Well, all I'll say is we understood that we had to stick to international waters. <laughs> <laughs> That was an, think, that's an answer worthy of Mr. Attlee, that, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean, you've all probably seen the hardback. I mean, it, it is a very, very big book. And one of the, the things we did struggle with was, obviously, we had access to certain operational reports. It was really cherry-picking the best of the operational reports that we had. We could have put other stuff in there, but it would have just been essentially reinforcing the points that we were making, highlighting the types of operations that went on at the time. But, um, yeah, I... I'll leave it. But your mention of the stories is interesting because the, 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 the genius of the submarine service at spinning dits, I think, has no equal. And there are some stories which are not in there, but I still to this day don't know if we're being wound up or not. I suspect we were. And if we weren't, it's truly, truly hilarious. Um, I carry those in my head. There's a special inner safe in my head where they remain. One of the challenges. They're not yeah. in the book. And uh, the, the, the submariners. Um, the greatest of company. I mean, they are the silent service, but when they were authorised to talk to us, they didn't hold back. <laughs> and these stories were of a rightness and of a raffishness, which, uh, having been brought up in the 1950s, took my breath away. Was there anything that you, that you discovered in the course of writing that really surprised you? Uh, I mean, the, the biggest surprise for me, um, and this was highlighted in... Uh, Lord West highlighted it in his review in The Spectator, was the weapons uh, side of the story, just how... Um, really, up until the 
mid early to mid 1980s before then the submarine service really didn't have an effective torpedo i mean the mark 8 which was a world war ii era torpedo was kept in service until the, the mid 80s i think mm. the torpedo that sank the belgrano was a 1980s, oh, yes, uh, 80s torpedo yeah. Yeah. um yeah. and it's one of the one of those quotes that you come across when you're researching for hours and days and weeks on end it was the um uh, flag officer submarines in the 60s writing to the first sea lord just as they these new ssns are coming online and there isn't an effective tor- there is not an effective torpedo and the submarine service has just been announced it's just been announced that the submarine service is going to become the main striking element of the fleet once the carriers get taken out of service and he writes you must understand how increasingly pointless it is to go on building modern day capital ships and arming them with the equivalent of a bow and arrow um, because I think it was the Mark 23 torpedo which had a reliability rate of 23%, I think, oh, at one wow. point. Um, so that was something that really surprised me. I hadn't really picked up on that. But I should also say that that problem was not unique to the Royal Navy. The Americans had huge problems getting a reliable torpedo, but they did what the United States can do, which is just throw huge amounts of money at the problem. And I then, of course, we all know the Russians have had problems with torpedoes as well, the Kursk being an example. I think what surprised me was just how many things have to go right all the time to keep us a top-of-the-range submarine nation, even if we weren't a deterrent-carrying submarine service. Mm. So many things have to go right all the time that it's the most enormous enterprise, and it's little known about outside the business. And even within the business, there's not always that great an appreciation about other people's bits, need to know, and all that. So I think that was what really rather took my breath away. It is a huge and complicated national enterprise, and it's not always seen as such. No. It's it partly comes out because in what you say about building them, too. Yes. Mm. It's partly because, as mm. Kevin Tebbit once said, um, we are the most reluctant of all the nuclear powers, which in many ways is to our credit. I do think that we should go through or, uh, what we do always go through before we're building another generation of submarines, or we'll go through again when it's time to consider whether there has to be a new warhead. Uh, it is all to the great credit of our country. But it, the, the downside of that is it's not appreciated just what an extraordinary enterprise it is and the level of skill that has to be created and sustained. And that, that did surprise and me. And the dire consequences, actually, of not maintaining high standards. I mean, Absolutely. That's the other thing that seems to yeah. come through. Yeah. So you wanted to... Mm-hmm. Mike Hodler from mm-hmm. Ruthie. Um, I, I was in anti-submarine warfare concepts in the MOD in the, in the mid-'80s. But at the um, U.S. Naval War College at Newport, uh, where I was there at the end of that period... Um, teaching, uh, there was an urban myth which um, Tom Clancy is meant to have said that uh, American submariners are just really engineers. It's only the British submariners that actually know how to fight. Is that something that came out of your book at all? It, it did a bit because I was at Glasgow Airport with the French equivalent of teacher the first time I'd been on, peri- on the perisher course. And uh, I said, what's the difference? And he said, uh, you create warriors, we're all nuclear engineers. And um, it was this interesting point, really, because the warrior element, the parish, of course, is very carefully crafted for that, isn't it? I mean, you, you know what the difference is. And um, I was with a group of very seasoned old Cold War American operators of the underwater type, and I said, what's the difference? And one of them said, quite simply, it's balls. Balls, that's <laughs> what the Royal Navy has. <laughs> I think we put that in the book, didn't we? I think you did, yeah. yeah. I hope so. <laughs> well, where, where are the French on this spectrum? <laughs> I think they're well. They're similar. I think their philosophy is very similar to the Americans. That they, you have to have a, a pretty good knowledge of what's going on at the back end of the boat as well. Right. And that right. on the they're American side, that is the, mm. the Rickover legacy, which has mm. lasted since Rickover started things off in the mid 50s. I mean, he interviewed every single nuclear submarine commander uh, for a significant period of the Cold War. They would have to go up in front of him, and he would do all sorts of very strange things to see if they were responsible enough. Had the um, to, to command a nuclear submarine, and he did try, and uh, with Lord Louis, with Lord Mountbatten to try and interview all the British COs of nuclear powered submarines as well. Uh, but Mountbatten put his foot down and said, "I cannot allow you to be choosing the Queen's uh, you know, Queen's <laughs> officers to command our submarines." Um. Anyone else? Yeah, Malcolm. Malcolm. Hmm. I, I, I wonder. Uh, Malcolm from the Institute. The deterrent force has always been based in Scotland. And I'd be interested in your reflections as to how that colours, if at all, the way in which uh, the people that serve in these submarines think about their role. Mm. Because they live in the area. (laughs) They are, in some regards, uh, Scottish. 
And of course, as political debate has evolved in Scotland, nationalism has ebbed and flowed. Uh, they're not isolated entirely from that. So how does how does that feel for those mm. for those crews facing with that? Quite a lot of the submariners are Scots, aren't they? You notice that on the, all the boats you go on. Um, we used to talk about this quite a bit when we were out on the boats or uh, in, in at Faz Lane, and um, it was a period when because it took us three years to write it, and it was the run up to the Scottish referendum, and of course I, I'd. I'd blown this secret, but in a way that the world didn't notice it, in the tablet, the Catholic magazine, which is I write occasional column for. But HMG, the Cabinet, had forbidden everybody to do any contingency planning at all for Scottish separation, including what on earth you do if uh, there is separation and the SNP government decides to carry through their great life quest of denuclearizing Gerlach and so on. Um, and we did a... You did, you did masses of work on that, Malcolm, which we found very useful. And Jinxie dug out the original study of where the Polaris force might go and we looked at that didn't we mm. and, and we used that and uh, it's very instructive to look at it really because there was Portland which is you know, out of the running now, Devonport, Falmouth, Milford Haven and was it two or three places in Scotland um, but it, it's very, it narrows it doesn't it and how long it would take and the cost. I think your study suggested it wasn't quite such the enormous undertaking that Perhaps James and I thought it was. But I thought it was a terrible position to be in, where the people who really know in the MOD and in the Navy were expressly forbidden by the Cabinet to do even the back-of-the-envelope calculations, whereas you could do your study and we could speculate in the book. And, of course, the same happened in the run-up to Brexit, didn't it? No contingency planning. Well, I think Brexit shows. disproves the wisdom of this technique. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say quickly, it would be interesting to ask that question in 50, 20 years when... Because one of the big changes from the Cold War is during the Cold War, we had submarine squadrons based all over the United Kingdom and even abroad as well. So you had the submarine, I know there are still submarines down in Devonport, but you had HMS Dolphin, the traditional home of the submarine service, Chatham. and Chatham, places mm. like that. But of course now all of that is getting moved up to Scotland. I can't remember the exact, is it a submarine area of excellence, I think is the, what, what, what they're creating up there. So it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next year, over the coming years. But one of the things that I picked up in my PhD was that when they announced the shipbuilding, the contracts f to build the four resolution class or five resolution class submarines, um, the Scottish shipyards were up in arms because they had lost out on the shipbuilding orders. It had gone to Barrow and to Camel Laird. And it's hinted at in the files that a political decision was taken that it's absolutely untenable not to give Scotland any part of the programme because the original decision and they, it, it, for the first, I think, month and a half, they were going to go to Devonport. That's where the, the operating base was going to be, in Devonport. And then someone said, I don't think this is a good idea, let's look at it again. And I think it's probably one of the shortest working committees in history of Whitehall made the decision in about a week and a half, or three weeks, I think it was, or something like that. And there's a wonderful cartoon you can find in the Naval Review, which is essentially a load of naval officers with a map going like this. <laughs> <laughs> I did a couple of years ago at that wonderful dinner that Babcock invited parliamentarians mm. to find myself sitting next to an SNP figure who I like and admire very much and I suggested this, uh, steered the conversation that way as subtly as I could and suggested he might want to go down to the National Archives and get the sovereign base deal out that Sir Frank Cooper conducted, concluded with Archbishop Macarios but I didn't get anywhere at all actually. <laughs> <laughs> thought it was worth a try. Right. Still well, might be. <laughs> But one last question from anyone? Yeah. Sir? I, I know we usually end up asking a question that's usually more of a ramble. Could you, could you just take the microphone, if you don't mind, just to hear who you are? Uh, Rupert Pingeli, I, I, I'm a member. Um, I, my uncle was a flag officer of submarines, and in his early days, he, um, it, his finest achievement, he thought, was in fact precipitating this argument between um, the UK and the US. Uh, when he was a mere captain, uh, over who should be responsible for uh, acceding to the appointments of uh, Royal Navy submarine captains. Um, uh, but uh, the, what I notice now in fly-on-the-wall documentaries is that Perisher seems to have American captains on it. Mm. Are you aware whether or not it is in fact possible for these American captains to be failed by their Brits? I mean, has the, the boot shifted oh, to the other been. foot now? I think in the past they have been. 
Also, there's a French officer who's come through Perisher now, too. But I think American candidates for Perisher have been failed in the past, haven't they? I think so. Yeah. Nodding going round for those who know. <laughs> fail them, but they can't fail us. Do you have any, do you have any, an do you have any last reflections, either of you, for, for about the future? Well, I think well, it, was, well, it was very yeah. interesting in terms of timing <laughs> that um, just as we published the book, uh, there were a lot of headlines about mysterious periscopes popping up off Scotland. Mm. I mean, the timing was very, uh, very well done because we were, we were delayed um, because we didn't really know what we didn't know. Um, so it took a, bit, a, a lot longer to write than we'd originally hoped. But um, it is very interesting just reading all the history, seeing it set out in that way and then looking at what is going on today and some of the interesting things that have come out in the press about what the Russian submarine force and the wider Russian Navy are doing. We've suffered a little bit, it's, that's the wrong word probably, because we've had wonderful cooperation. It's because the, the silent service is exactly that. When Russian activity gets to a certain level in the air or on the surface, the press get to know about it very quickly. But when it's the deep Cold War, which never went away, not a flicker. So, in terms of the sales of the paperback, if something could perhaps be arranged, <laughs> we'd be very grateful. Well, Peter and James, thank you very much indeed for both uh, for an excellent contribution to our knowledge. I think we further, further books are, I think, envisaged at least by you, James. Um, and uh, I wish you the greatest possible luck with Oops. not only the sales of the hardback, but also, I'm omitted to say, it is now available in paperback. Is it, is it actually available here or not? I don't, it isn't. I don't right. think so. You will have to go to a, a nearby bookshop to buy one, but it will be <laughs> Top readily, of the road, water stone, readily, exactly, <laughs> readily available. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed this session, and I hope you will agree with the judges uh, that this is a, a, a work eminently worthy of this medal. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Thank you, Paul.